Let's get started with Chapter 1 of French for Reading. This will be the first of about three parts. In this chapter, we're going to cover about 50% of French vocabulary. Now, this is going to be the easy 50%, but it's really important that we get this down because we can, we can just get an awful lot from a bunch of simple rules having to do with cognates. Now, what do I mean by cognates? Cognates are words that have the same meaning in the two languages, and they can be classified in different ways. There's true, true cognates that have the same meaning and perhaps the same spelling or similar meaning. For example, in French, there is la religion. And you look at that word and you can probably guess that it's religion. Now, the word la that comes before there, that's the word for the, the direct article when it's a feminine word. So, and religion is feminine. Um, and you always have to have a, a definite article on uh, French words. Um, so you can translate that either as the religion or just religion, because you don't have to have a definite article. You don't have to have the word the uh, or a, an indefinite article in uh, English, but in French you do when you write the word. La psychologie, that you can probably guess is psychology. Now we wouldn't say the psychology in English. Um, we would just say psychology. And it's spelled almost the same way, except it ends in an IE rather than a Y. And there's a lot of these, these, these little sm small groups of letters that change from one to another. So typically, words that end in IE in French end in Y in English. So these are true cognates. Now there's partial cognates that have similar or overlapping meaning and a similar spelling. Now what do I mean by overlapping meaning? In any language, a word can have a range of meanings. It, and that's why if you look down a dictionary, it might give 20 different definitions for it. That's the range of meanings. Words mean different things in different contexts. Partial cognates have similar meanings in some contexts. So let's take the word l'histoire. And so we have an L apostrophe there, which is a shortened form of LA in front of words that start with a vowel or a silent H, like this one. So that's why it's not LA history, it's l'histoire. And we just kind of blend it all together and put a uh, an apostrophe there. And contractions are not optional in French. They're mandatory when they have to happen. Now you look at the word histoire, and you can see how that kind of looks like the word history. And that, if you want to talk about history, that's the normal word to use for history. But it also means a normal uh, word for a story. So a little kid, before they're going to uh, go to bed, would say, Papa, raconte-moi une histoire. Daddy, tell me a story. And they would use histoire. And so it's like, the kid sounds like, to us, he's asking, Oh, Daddy, please give me a history lesson. Well, no, no, that's not what he's doing. Histoire just means a story. And you can kind of see the word story in the word histoire. So that's the origin of both our word history and our word story, but they've diverged into two different directions in uh, uh, English. Now, you can wonder, whoa, does having, does having a story, does, do, since the word story and history are the same, does that change a fr French perspective on, on history? Because humans are made to, to understand stories. There's very few things that we do as well as listen to stories or tell stories. Um, listen to abstract philosophy, uh, we don't do too well on that. Doing math, we don't do too well on that. Listening to stories and telling stories, we're humans are good at that. So by having the same uh, word for both story and history, that could influence French culture so that they might have a more positive attitude towards history than we as Americans do. 
Then the third category of uh, cognates is false cognates. And those are words that look like uh, a French word that looks like an English word or an English word that looks like a French word, but it has a different meaning. For example, if we have the word le coin, that looks like the word for coin. No, nope, it's not. It means the corner, the place, or the neighborhood. That's a false cognate, or sometimes called a false friend, because it looks like a word that you can know, but you can recognize, but it's not. In fact, the word for coin is la pièce, P-I-E-C-E. -E. Um, so uh, that's a false cognate. Now here's some example of some cognate nouns, and you can tell real easy what they uh, they mean. Le gouvernement means the government. La légalité means the legality, or just legality. Le conducteur means a conductor, like a band conductor. But it also means a driver. Uh, someone who's driving a car is called a conduct conducteur. Une odeur, that's an odor. Un gladiateur is a gladiator. L'intérieur is the inside. L'anthologie is an anthology. Les Baptistes are the Baptists. Now notice how in English, if we were writing about a denomination, we would put a capital B. And in your translation, you should put a capital B. But um, denominations and many other things in French are not capitalized. They use fewer capital letters in uh, French than in English. And when you translate them, don't follow the capitalization uh, in the French text, use the capitalization that should be in the English text. And finally, we have les offres, which would be the offers, like an economic term. term. Now let's go to the third section of your book, page four, and guess what? There's already a bunch of typos that we have to correct. Um, fortunately, this seems to be the majority of typos in the book. Um, Somebody must have dropped their note cards or something when they were typesetting this book or something. So let's just kind of go through these. Um, sorry, uh, my writing is not too good. I wrote in my book many years ago, and I didn't expect people to have to read it on a video. Um, the uh, um, So what, what these are, these are video endings. Uh, no, video. These are adjective endings. And... Um, the words that end in EUX and EUSE usually correspond to OUS in English. For example, the word anxieux and généreux, anxieux means anxious, and généreux means generous. And if these were feminine, they would be, they would be anxieux and généreux. Um, so but they're, they're O-U-S, so E-U-X and E-U-S-E usually corresponds to O-U-S. Uh, if an adjective ends in I-Q-E, which is both the masculine and the femi feminine ending, that usually corresponds to ick or ickle, like cosmique is cosmic, and mécanique is mechanical. Now, it can also be a mechanic as a noun, too. But as an adjective, we would say mechanical. Now, if a word ends in obla, that one's not hard to figure out. That corresponds to obla. Like, agréable is agreeable. Gouvernable is governable. Words that are not often used to uh, describe uh, French people, or as they often joke about things like that. Um, the French are uh, n known for being very frank. In fact, the word frank comes from the word uh, French, and uh, I tell you exactly what they think, so they would, uh, they do not see themselves as an agreeable people wanting to agree real easily, and their history indicates, and they well know, that they are not very uh, governable, as we'll see in a text uh, near the end of the uh, class. Okay, here's another typo. Words that end in E-L for the masculine, or E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, usually correspond to all, like the word annuel 
for masculine and annuel for feminine is annual. Real or real would be real. And if it ends in if, if, the masculine or ive, the feminine, usually corresponds to eve, like abus uh, or ev. Abusive, abusive would be abusive. Um, subjective, subjective would be subjective. And then the final typo is words that end in en, en, or en, n, e, n, usually correspond to an. Okay, so those are the typos. Now, actually, I think I've got this on the lecture here. So where did we stop? Oh, we, we stopped here. So words that end in en and en become en, like Indian or Indian, um, a male Indian or a female Indian. And it's interesting that corresponds both to American Indians and uh, South Asian Indians. That would be uh, um, uh, Indian. We would just use the word Indian with an A for both of them. Uh, the book of the Bible, Philippien, is written with an E in uh, French, but it's written with an A in English. We'll often see the E-N becoming A-N when we translate it. Words that end in A-N-T and A-N-T-E, if they don't stay ending in A-N-T, become ing, because this is the ending for the present participle. So we might see the word charmant, that means charming, something that's masculine, something feminine, that's charmant, would be charming. The a-n-t and the a-n-t-e get changed to ing's. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about cognate, cognate adjectives and talk about the word order. In French, the adjective normally comes after the noun. So we might have the word le chat blanc. Okay, le chat is the cat. And you can kind of see that. Take out the H and it says cat. So that's, it's pretty similar. And then we have the word blanc, which means either blank or white. And you can see how those have pretty similar uh, uh, meanings too. So le chat blanc, you wouldn't translate that as the cat white or the cat blank. You would translate that as the white cat because we put the adjective generally before the noun in English. If the adjective precedes the noun, which it usually doesn't, but sometimes it does, it usually takes on a figurative sense. For example, here we have an um grand. So, un is the word a for a masculine noun, the indefinite article. Um is the word for man, kind of like homo sapiens. That's um is a man. And then grand, and that, that's like a word uh, grand. But he, so here we have it as in the normal adjective place. And what that means, grand in a, a literal sense, means tall or big. So it's usually talking about um, uh, 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 the, the height. If you say an homme grand, it's a, a tall man. Most other, the most common translation of the word grand is, is big, but when it's talking about a person, it means tall in the physical sense when it go, comes after the noun. Un grand homme is the, are the same words, but here the word grand is in front of the noun. So this takes on a figurative sense, a, fi uh, a figuratively, a larger than life person. So we would translate that as a great man. So an homme grand is a tall man, a grand homme is a great man. And so uh, I'm, I'm 6'3", so I'm a, a, a tall man, but I aspire to be un grand homme, a great man, someone who does something really good. We'll see if we get there. Oops. So here's uh, uh, another example. Um, le résultat identique. So here, le, is the masculine form of the, the definite article. The résultat 
is the result. It's got that extra syllable there, but you can see the word result in it. Identique, and you can guess that's the identical. And here, identical is in the normal place of the, after the noun. So we would translate this as the identical result. Now here, we've got another expression, une abondante bibliographie. So une is the feminine form of un, meaning a, and we've got bibliographie is a bibliography, and we've got abondante in front of it. Now bibliographie is feminine, and so that's got an e on it, and that's got an e on it, and Literally, it says an abundant bibliography, but that's, the adjective is in front of the noun, so it's got to be used in some type of figurative sense. Now, you could probably say an abundant bibliography. That's a beautiful figurative speech, but it would be norm, more normal to say a rich bibliography in English. And that's, that's, that tends to be the adjective that we use for uh, a bibliography that has a, a, a good good range of entries and quite a few of them. So, as we've been alluding to, you should note that adjectives agree with the noun that they modify in gender and number. So if a noun is feminine, you add E, and if it's plural, you add S. Now, how do you know if it's masculine or feminine? There's two ways. One, you can grow up speaking French, and you just always hear how they're used in with masculine and feminine articles and adjectives, or you can look them up in the dictionary, which is probably the case for most of you and which is really painful. Um, there's no uh, logic to uh, what's masculine and what's feminine. There's a few patterns. We'll see that words that end in E tend to be feminine, um, but there's so many exceptions that um, uh, Sometimes people don't have too much faith in that uh, rule. So, for example, if we have a shah cri, a shah is a cat, cri is gray, and the, that would be a gray cat. And we can kind of see that cri looks like gray. Now, if we had a, a female cat, there's a special word for a female cat, un shot cris. And that would be, we would translate that either as a gray cat or a gray girl cat or a gray female cat, um, uh, whatever the context demands. Normally, we don't need to, we're not trying to indicate the gender of the cat, but if we are, we would indicate it in some way like that. So notice how um, uh changes pronunciation when you add an E. It goes from uh, don't pronounce the last N, and you make the nasal uh sound. With the add the e, the nasal sound disappears. Un, you pronounce the u sound and you pronounce the n, but the e is silent. Sha, the t is silent. The ch makes the uh, sh sound always in French. But when you add the extra e and you add the an extra t because that looks better. Un shot you pronounce the, the T there. And for cri, the S is silent, but cri's, the S is pronounced as a Z because when S is between two vowels, it's pronounced like a, a Z. If it's not between two vowels and it's pronounced, like if there's a double S or something like that, or um, it's pronounced as, a, as an S. But between two vowels, it's pronounced as a Z. Okay, so here is an exercise, and this is the end of the first section of the tape. So what you need to do is you need to uh, end this video or put it on pause so that you can see these phrases and write down these phrases. And do not look at the answers until you write these down. You're going to say, oh, these are really easy. Well, they might not all be as easy as you think, and then when you correct them, you'll be able to... Uh, uh, see uh, what happened, and these exercises are going to get really difficult uh, pretty quickly. So I want you to get in the habit of writing down all these exercises. They'll typically be three or four per chapter so that you can practice knowing these things. Now you can use your dictionary 
and you can use the, the book to look at the rules because the goal is not to test you. The goal is you, to get you to process this information and apply it to translating new sentences, new phrases. So use your textbook, use your dictionary. Do not use any electric translator. You will not learn anything that way. For the test, um, you'll be able to use your dictionary and any notes you have in your dictionary. So feel free to put lots and lots of notes in your dictionary. You won't be able to use post-its stuck in your dictionary or um, papers, but you can write in your dictionary all that you want. And uh, I know some people just fill up their dictionary with pages and pages of notes. Um, so uh, these are uh, the, the expressions that you'll translate. So when you've written down all nine, you can start the next video.